that's what we will delve into. Um, Slogies, that's cute. That sounds like something an Australian would say. Um, <clears throat> so our slogies or Lojong slogans this evening. That's what we will delve into. Of course, doing some meditation in the beginning and also we'll do a meditation towards the end. I know that um, myself and maybe many of you, it's just the, uh, this, I don't want this to come out the wrong way, but the darkness is calling. Just the darkness of these days and this call inward. It's just really lovely. I feel myself getting quieter. I feel the city getting quieter. A uh, real invitation for us to dig into our practice. So before we get started, do we start with some wonderful announcements? We do. The most important of which is that it's just delightful to see the Sangha. And um, we come together in this way uh, for to be together and to grow together and to deepen together. And one of the ways that we um, do that is through generous donations from our community. So Katie's going to drop a link into the chat at some point about how to do that. So that would be wonderful. People can give what they can. We totally understand that the pandemic doesn't seem to be ending and nor does our federal government seem to be helping. And so you give what makes sense for you. Um, and um, it also helps support our amazing teachers. And then we have some cool stuff this weekend. So we have regular, our regular schedule, which is rich and full. And Michael Taft regularly is on tomorrow night, which he will be and Friday and Sunday evenings, there's recovery Dharma and there's lots more than that. But here's the cool stuff on Friday night, Michael Owens is gonna teach a class uh, called visual Buddhism. And he's gonna do a little bit of tracing around like how Buddhism was transferred um, orally and then through the different, the different languages and images so pretty cool um and he's just like a crazy i don't even know how much information fits in some one person's brain on although we have a couple brainiacs in this crew so but still very cool and then sunday um we have our once a month really sweet gathering with the aloka vihara nuns and that happens at 1 30 to 3 so like a kind of nice middle of the day um pam was like baffled by how I'm reading my the, no, that's piece not. of notes that are hard to read. Katie sent a note about it. Um, okay. And then Katie's putting stuff about the details of both of those events in the chat. And the, and then the cool thing about Sunday, like you could do like a whole weekend, you could do Michael Owens Friday night, and then Sunday you could do the nuns, and then you could do Michael Owens again on, fr on Sunday evening and just like have a sandwich of a weekend that is just delicious. So a Dharma sandwich. Um, and that's that's my announcements. So thank you, really happy you're all here. Oh, and I hope you guys all know that these get recorded and put on the SF Dharma Collective YouTube channel. I don't know if we've actually ever announced that. Um, we are careful to make sure that your images are not recorded. Um, the teachers are pinned. But if you ever are like, oh my God, that was so juicy, or I have no idea what they were talking about and I need to do it again. Like, what was that slogan and why is that important? Um, you can go to the YouTube channel and you can also tell friends, like check out this amazing talk. Okay, now I really am done. And you can also feel at ease to fall asleep um, during any point this evening and come back and check it out. Another thing that, <laughs> I was on an online retreat recently and um, in one of the sessions, one of the yogis fell asleep um, and all the teachers stay on at the end and one participant was just sleeping, which I thought was very sweet. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. And a, a huge endorsement for Michael Owens. If you are someone for whom um, scholarly knowledge and a real deep understanding of where these practices come from is exciting to you, this is, incredible. Um, and I, I also really invite all of you to consider if there's a possibility for you, this is not true for everyone, if there is possibly over this holiday time, a day or two or even three, where you can do um, silent practice. I really, really support that. Um, and I'd be happy to leave a little bit of time in our question and answer if people are interested in knowing about how do you set up a self retreat. It's a really beautiful gift to yourself, if it's possible. You know, for some of us, there's full homes and 
other obligations or work ongoing. But if that is something, um, I, I really recommend it. And um, yeah, happy we can talk about that a little bit. It really relates to our themes tonight with the slogans. And a lot of the themes for this evening are around what are our commitments to this practice? What are we committing to? And I think that's a really, it's always a meaningful reflection. And especially right now in the end of the year, as we kind of naturally are taking stock and looking back on what happened and what do we foresee for the year ahead? And <clears throat> this practice of setting intentions for the year, uh, resolutions for the year, that is, a, I think it's a beautiful practice for some people. It creates maybe a sense of striving or anxiety, but if held lightly, it's a nice way for us to really honor this time um, of, again, having the shortening of the days and the longer nights, a real invitation inward. So this evening, we're going to start with the preliminaries, as we have done a number of times. And even before we do that practice, I just want to give us like a little bit of sense of time of where we are. So as some of you may remember this preliminaries practice, it's also the first point. So in the Lojong, which has these 59 slogans, there are seven points and each of the slogans underneath those points supports them. And the preliminaries practice, there's only one point and that's what we'll practice together. Just these reminders of this precious human life. The second point that we've already covered is absolute and relative bodhicitta. So maybe you remember the slogans um, such as, in the post-meditation experience, one should become a child of illusion or self-liberate even the antidotes. These are the practices that really invite and encourage us to train in a bodhicitta or an awakened heart that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis, that we can manage some of the annoyances and struggles or even the pain but also an absolute bodhicitta so that we can really invite ourselves to consider what would it be like to extend an open heart to every being, every being, living, non-living, past, future, present. So that's our second point. The third point is really transforming adversity into the path. And I think for many of us who have heard about Lojong or maybe just a little familiarity, that's the one that sticks out where we really turn towards what is difficult and transform it into the very medicine that we need. So there's a, a beautiful analogy of, if there is a, a poisonous plant, do you just try to cut it off and have it no longer survive? Or do you dig it out from the roots and make those roots into medicine? That's this kind of essence of this turning all adversity into the path. The fourth point is, really practicing with your whole life. And that sounds similar, but really these are the practices that you might remember in which we think about how do we bring these practices into our living and into our dying? So are there ways that we can kind of condense our heart practices and prepare ourselves, not only in this life, but also for the end of life? Point five, which we just completed, is what's called the assessment or evaluation of our mind training. And in this, you might remember again, a slogan of the two witnesses hold the principal one. It's really helping ourselves understand what is the origin of this mind training we are doing. That what are we able to look at and identify within ourself as part of what this mind training is progressing. So the last slogan last week, I, I love this one. If you can practice even when distracted, you are well-trained. So normalizing and de-shaming because all of us are distracted when we practice, <laughs> right? So to really say that that distraction can still be part of your practice and that you can really kind of come back and keep coming back and keep coming back and including that distraction. A really, really beautiful way to assess and develop a sense of confidence in our training. And this evening, we start off on point six, and I, I'm really appreciating point six for tonight and for this time, like I was saying, this time of the year in which we're thinking about our commitment and we're thinking about the ethics. Why are we doing this? What for? What gives us that commitment? And so that is, that is where we will venture in this evening, starting to kind of dip our toe into that 
And this idea of commitment and ethics, it's so beautiful. It really brings us up so intimately to what we take refuge in, also into our very vow of the Bodhisattva. And if you have been wondering for many years or at least many weeks now, what is a Bodhisattva and what is the Bodhisattva vow? Tonight is your night. We're gonna delve deeply into that. If you've heard about the Bodhisattva and you've already taken your vows, tonight is your night. We are revisiting those juicy, juicy vows, remembering why and how we do this. So without further ado, we will come into practice. And again, this evening, what I'll start us with is a bit of the preliminaries within our practice. So we will close our eyes and reflect on these first phrases before we move into a practice of settling the mind in its natural state as we've been doing. So please find a posture that is comfortable, giving yourself the full luxury of really noticing where is the spine at its most upright. Maybe that's slightly leaning forward and then to the back and then side to side and really finding where does the spine naturally feel upright and aligned? We're always considering this posture as a posture of dignity, not just a place of nourishment and relaxation, but a place in which here we honor our commitment, our commitment to be on this path of practice and awakening. Give yourself a moment to feel and notice where the hands are folded or resting in your lap or on your thighs. And feel and invite a spaciousness through the belly. If there's anything that's cinching or tight around the belly area, give yourself that loosened freedom so the breath can be completely free. Feel just the slightest lift of the chest. So there were an invisible thread from the heart up to the ceiling. and invite a softness or softening through the shoulders. It may help to inhale your shoulders up to your ears just once and then exhaling them back down and allowing that sensation of softness through the shoulders. And feeling the chin just gently pointed forward with the eyes still closed, or if it's more comfortable having them slightly open, you can imagine that your gaze is just slightly downward. And take a couple breaths to feel through that central channel, that column of light from the sits bones up to the crown of the head. And whether you are achy or agitated, or you feel light and open, feel this body as the body of meditation. Feel this body as ready. And we'll begin in this practice of preliminaries 
with this intention and motivation to view your entire life, all the suffering and all the joy with a sense of resolve and personal responsibility that this very life is where all the practice can take root, can grow and flourish. So as we take on these preliminaries, we let the phrase and the words of it just land in the heart, in the body and in the mind. Notice the embodied experience of, of what it feels like when you hear these phrases and words. And without overanalyzing or being conceptual, just simply rest in what these words bring forth. And the first phrase of these preliminary practices is to reflect on the rarity and preciousness of human life. And then next, reflect on the absolute inevitability of death. And continuing to the third, reflect on the awesome and indelible power of our actions. Every action, big or small, produces a result. And the fourth of these reflections, I reflect on the inescapability of suffering. And with whatever sentiment or feeling has been stirred through these reflections, we invite a real setting of intention here, one based in these realities, this precious human life, this inevitability of death and suffering the incredible consequence of small and large actions. And 
What is our intention then for being here together tonight to train the heart and the mind? And gently letting this intention and aspiration fall into the background, integrating itself into the practice. And moving now towards focusing our attention. Now that we've identified the motivation, bringing the full force of our attention and our awareness to the breath. Begin by focusing on the breath wherever it is easy to notice. Maybe at the belly, maybe the sensations at the nostrils or the rise and fall of the chest. Commit to this breath. Commit to the attending closely of this breath. Whenever the mind is caught up in distraction of any sort, simply relax, release whatever has captured your attention and return, refreshing your interest in noticing the breath. all of our highest intentions, aspirations, and motivations for our own transformation and to be of service to others. It relies upon developing this steady, stable attention. Let's narrow the focus a bit more, noticing the sensations of breath at the nostrils. Noticing that subtle sensation as cool air travels in. Notice the subtle sensations as warmer air travels out. Investigate with curiosity. Where can you notice the sensation of breath around the nostrils? Is it at the edges? Is it at the tip of the nose? Is it above the lip?
every single time you notice you're caught up in distraction, you are further training the mind. Whether you are called back to practice by my voice or by a sound or simply coming into awareness that you are caught up in thought, fantasy, memory. Relax, release and refresh your interest coming back to the breath again and again and again. while maintaining some aspect of our attention to the breath, we expand the aperture, gently opening the eyes and softly focusing with a panoramic vision focused in no single place. Imagine as though you could see to each corner and edge of the periphery Feel or imagine as though you could even see behind you, below you. With this soft, open gaze. Feel or imagine the soft openness of the mind. For this practice, the object of focus is the space of the mind and whatever arises within it. Feel that this space of the mind is all around you, within you. And whatever arises within it, whether it's a sound or a thought or a sensation, simply let it arise and fall away, going right back from where it came. If you find yourself spaced out, dull, you can always return to closing the eyes for a moment, refocusing on the breath at the nostrils. If you find yourself with a mind that's just too busy, going here, going there, you can also close the eyes and gently focus on the breath at the belly to ground. And then returning to this practice of finding the space of mind by noticing the contents that arise within it.
a metaphor sometimes used in this practice is imagine yourself to be like the loving grandparent watching their grandchild. No need to interfere, no need to do anything. That's the job of the parents. Just watching your thoughts as though they were this beloved grandchild going here and going there, but not dragging you along with them. That relaxed, open, loving presence with whatever arises in the mind. Feel or imagine the boundless and limitless quality of your own awareness. Gently closing the eyes, regathering the attention to the field of the body. And for a couple more moments here, letting our mind and our attention rest in the tactile sensations within the body, noticing whatever is easy to notice. Feel or imagine the fullness and the emptiness of this body.
Thank you all for your practice. I find that practicing with the preliminaries before a meditation, it grounds me. It tenderizes my heart, like it makes it feel feelingful to say the least. But then there's also a sense of, yeah, of course I'm here. Where else would I be? Um, I hope that some of that was experienced um, a little bit by you all as well. Um, happy to take any questions on that practice or any reflections on that practice before we move in. Wait, I said that too soon. Think of your wonderful questions, put them in the chat. I want to just mention and, and highlight it's so wonderful to see familiar, many familiar faces here. Um, though, of course, I imagine there might be some people for whom it's their first time. So just as a welcoming to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, I want to welcome you to this entire community. And this is a community where truly we uphold as much as possible the respect and non-harming of the, these traditions that we are learning in. And as such, when we come together and we ask questions or maybe even we say uh, a reflection on our practice, the ask here, the expectation is that we are holding each other with a compassion and mindful awareness. Also recognizing that we have no idea what each of us are going through right now. I mean, anytime, but especially right now. So if someone is sharing something that may sound just so different from your experience, really having the humility to just hold and respect whatever is the lived experience of another being on this call. It's of utmost important to us to generate and sustain a sense of safety and connection here. Our sense of belonging is what allows us to really grow in this practice. So that is our, our huge priority. And um, as always, if there are ways that we can improve that for any of you on this call, whether it's your first time or your 500th time, please reach out to us. Uh, maybe it's easier to reach out to Mace or Pamela or Katie or Noam and just let us know. Um, it matters so much. So with that, are there any questions on your practice or that practice in general? You can either put them in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, please. Good evening here and everybody. Nice to meet you. I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I've been having a, you know, pain in my body um, and it's very almost impossible for me to concentrate and, and meditate when that's happening. But I found that when I can relax enough uh, and concentrate on my breath, that helps. But I was wondering, what, what do you think about, you know, focusing on the, what, what can you do when there's pain? That's the question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I think there is, um, myself included, and I'm sure many people on this call have experienced different levels of pain um, at different times. So there's, um, it's, it's hard <laughs> is, the, is the easy answer. And then what's really wonderful, I will say, and I, I'm sure I've said this before, which is the whole reason that um, I myself have a job, for example, working in contemplative science and, and bringing these ideas to the greater public is because of the early discoveries that these practices help so much with pain. So there's been ongoing research that people who suffer from pain and chronic pain that simple practices of meditation really help not by taking away the entire experience of pain, but by taking away the contraction we have to pain. And so I think it's also a matter of orientation when we're meeting our pain, recognizing that the goal isn't like, can I just breathe my way out of it? 
Or can I focus on my breath so much that I push it away, but instead like the warm opening towards, right? And that that's hard. Pain is a signal directly to our brain that something is wrong, that something is completely wrong. And so it's a meeting that pain and that message of pain with, it's okay, I love you. And you can do that directly with the breath. So maybe the inhale is, here is this experience of pain, right? So bringing mindfulness to it. And then the exhale is, it's okay, I love you, or I'm safe. Something that has that soothing quality. That would be my recommendation. Also, depending on the type of pain, um, myself and other people with back pain, doing meditations um, while laying down in supine position, excellent to help the body relax, excellent. And of course, maybe the first couple times, there's more sleepiness, but that's okay. You let yourself sleep a little and then you're back into practice and continue practicing. And with pain, it can be very hard to sleep. So wherever you can find the moments of sleep, it will help your body a good deal. So. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Leanne, I will paste those preliminaries in. Um, I will actually, I'll, I'll say them, but I'll, I think it'll probably be helpful. Um, I'll paste them in in a moment too. So first is the rarity and preciousness of this human life. Second is the absolute inevitability of death for all of us. Third is the awesome and incredible powers of our actions, sometimes called karma, that every single tiny, tiny action has a result. That one really, <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then our fourth is that we just can't avoid suffering, that there is suffering. Um, so yes, and then Claudia, hi Claudia. Um, how to work with difficult thoughts and anxiety, just accepting and working through them, trusting and letting go. And is this specifically Claudia during, um, during meditation or in general? In general. In general. It's a particular situation in my life. Okay. And I this try to acute. And, yeah, and I try to work through that anxiety or that worry through meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to I don't know sometimes if I have to let the difficult thought just play out and work its way and and kind of like go through it or just try to not think about it and yeah. just and just try to be positive and just say, you know, you got to trust, you got to trust, this mm -hmm. will work out. Yeah. You know, and let go. I mean, because I realize that worrying doesn't help and I cannot control. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much I can do. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's just it's hard. It's yeah. Really difficult. I can hear I'm, that. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about my son who's working as a first, as an essential worker. Yeah. And, you know, in this situation right now, I mean, he tries to be as careful as possible, double mask, and we just got some shields for him and the whole thing. But, you know, you're taking risks. And I yeah. just, I worry for him. I worry for us as well. Yeah. So, because he lives with us. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, unfortunately, it's both a real and true worry, right? When our worries are just real, but not true, then we can kind of work with them and just kind of be calm. But actually your vigilance is needed, right? In order to protect yourself. So it's, it's a specific kind of situation. Um, my you know, um, my, my advice would be actually healthy distraction because this is gonna be an ongoing situation. Um, and to not, there's a kind of distraction where you're so checked out that there's no awareness, right? So you're doing something and you just, you know, maybe watching TV or doing a crossword puzzle and you're just ignoring everything. And then you come back and it's like, oh, 
it's so strong. So a distraction in which you're not kind of exiting or completely escaping, but you're giving yourself a little space, right? So if there's a place to safely walk outside, yeah. there's safely ways to, you know, always you can journal. Journaling still mm -hmm. number one mental health intervention of all time, period. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and just giving yourself that space. Cause I, you know, I, needless to say, I love meditation. I think it's enormously beneficial. Um, and we need to have other tools to help us um, and through our body and through reflection are wonderful tools. And maybe when you're on the walk, you can really engage with your senses, right? So grounding through whatever can be smelled and grounding through whatever can be seen and being able to then take that back into your home. So when you have that anxiety and just noticing like, what can you see? What can you smell? Yeah, yeah. Feel? So I'd go through the senses. I think you're smart to believe that maybe the analyzing won't make it better. And in fact, is like the kerosene on the fire. Hmm. So. Yeah, sometimes when I feel like really anxious then I, I kind of do a little bit of what you're saying is that I would, I, if I'm in bed, you know, I just open my eyes and I, I'm safe, I'm fine. You know, yeah. I look around and that kind of thing. It helps. Good. <sighs> Thank you. I'll Sorry. be holding you both, all, you, all of you in my heart. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, let's move on to uh, the actual um, slogan here. I was going to say the meat of the issue, but, you know, the tempeh of the issue or the uh, veggie burger. Um, so this slogan, I'm going to put it in the chat here, but I, I will still put the other four in at some point. The slogan always abide by the three basic principles. I love it. This is one of the slogans where they're just like, actually, we want to say three different things, but we're going to put it in this one slogan. So we'll say the three. Um, so I will, um, I'll share with you what the three are, and then we'll kind of get into it at a, a bit of a deeper level. So the, uh, the three basic principles that we will do here or that we'll um, cover is to really keep our commitments. And we'll talk about what those commitments are. Um, also that we really need to avoid outrageous or ostentatious conduct, which might not be what you think it is. And then um, the third is to cultivate patience which again is, is a familiar practice for most of us. Of course, it is one of the paramitas, one of our spiritual qualities. But again, for this slogan, it has a little bit of a different feeling. So let's start here with our commitments. Um, yeah, it's so beautiful. I, I really appreciate this first point of what we need to abide by in these basic principles. And the idea here is that when we are developing our mind, when we're doing this mind training, we're actually developing an ethics and a morality, a kind of a basis of which all of our practice should be established upon. And that if we aren't committing to this ethic and this morality of what we're doing, then we'll really have no momentum. And we'll have no way to move forward in this path. And really the commitments of this work and of Lojong um, and it's not required that you adhere to these, but this is what these practices refer to, is the bodhisattva vow and the refuge vow. And it's just, again, I said, this is our, our bodhisattva evening. I really actually get emotional when it comes to this bodhisattva vow. I find it incredibly beautiful. It's so meaningful. So meaningful that there is a way for all of us as a community and as individuals to adhere ourselves to what truly matters uh, in this practice. And it's so simple. I, I read this beautiful uh, description by Chogyam Trumpa today. And he says, um, Bodhisattva vow is the commitment to put others before oneself. It is a statement of willingness to give up one's own well being for the sake of others simple. And then he says, then the bodhisattva is just a person who lives in the spirit of that vow. So when we are thinking about the bodhisattva, it is someone who is committed, truly committed, taken to see that this is what my life is for. This is what I commit to. 
is really this, the spirit of that vow, uh, really kind of taking that in. And, um, you know, some of, some, of, uh, some of you all may know that uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, takes the Bodhisattva prayer for all humanity every morning. And it's a prayer, I, I do a version of it myself in my morning practice. It is so exquisitely beautiful. And um, I, I hope it stirs your heart the way it stirs my heart. His prayer is, may I be a guard for those who need protection. May I be a guide for those on the path, a boat, a raft, a bridge for those who wish to cross the flood. May I be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, a healing medicine for all who are sick, a vase of plenty, a tree of miracles. And for the boundless multitudes of living beings, may I bring sustenance and awakening, enduring like the earth and sky until all beings are freed from sorrow and all are awakened. It's a big vow. <laughs> it's a big vow. But I think what's interesting and what I, I like about the invitation of this vow is, um, and especially how it's coupled with the refuge vow, what else would we commit ourselves to? To accumulating as much worldly goods as we can, right? To having as many enjoyable experiences as we can. We can do that, but we don't commit ourselves to it. Right? That's not our enduring commitment. That's not our compass. That's not what really can move us forward. Um, and what I think the refuge vow invites us to is the refuge vow is really, um, and Chogyam said this, which I love. I've never heard this said before about the refuge vow. He says, the refuge vow is basically making a commitment to become a refugee. It means in essence that instead of always wanting security, you develop an attitude of wanting to step into uncharted territory. So when we take a refuge vow, when we become a refugee, we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, in our practices, in the teachings, in our community. And by doing so, we naturally renunciate or move away from all the other refuges, all the other false refuges, it can be, they can be hard to give up. But when we look closely, when we really pay close attention, and this is our insight practice, this is where, you know, these slogans, they provoke us to reflect upon what does give me an enduring sense of strength? Where do I find my true home? What does make my life purposeful? When do I feel good, really good? And when we look very closely in that way, the Bodhisattva vow and the refuge vow don't seem so impossible. They seem actually quite sane. And I'd be curious if anyone had any uh, thoughts or questions or reactions. That's a, that's a lot of commitment to put out there. How does that land with folks? Ah, oh, thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> I wonder at what point, like, I hear that vow and I'm like, well, I'm definitely not there. <laughs> like, I've got to do a lot of work before I could possibly, and I'm not going to make a vow that I know I can't keep. So I'm just going to chill. And so I like, and then I'm like, oh, well, if you're not making, if that's the attitude, then there's no, at what point do you, is there an aspiration to be able to make that vow? And so yeah. I'm like, it's a serious Beautiful vow. Question. It's not, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's very sane, <laughs> a very reasonable response. And, you know, this is where it's interesting, where we have this idea of absolute and relative bodhicitta, like at the same time, where it's, we know that we're capable of some level of bodhisattva acts and to put others before us. But how willing are we to put everyone before us? And not only to put them before us, but to like, put before us, even the people who treat us poorly, 
maybe them even farthest ahead of us. And it's actually, I do think it's kind of this exercising of the heart. It kind of asks you to like stretch that muscle as far as it can be stretched just to start developing that kind of flexibility. Not because every day we wake up as able to fulfill it, but we set our goals in this kind of utopic and aspirational way, knowing that we may not achieve it in this life. <laughs> and that isn't something to be sad about. It's something more like, I would love, I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. And we're so fortunate, right? We do have some living examples of people who, for the most part, seem to embody these values. And these are not just our amazing heroes of nonviolence and compassion. These are also everyday people. When we see the gentleness and kindness, when we see that their desire for all of us to be okay, right? This kind of collective. And it's interesting, one of the next um, aspects of this slogan is really emphasizing humility. And humility is a practice most of us can get behind of like, yeah, I could probably do more of that. And so it's like, what's the spectrum that we're putting ourselves on? Um, and I totally relate to this idea of like, I don't wanna take a vow I can't live up to. Um, but I think in my understanding and my, my personal experience of the Bodhisattva vow, it's an aspiration. It's like that light in the distance um, I remind myself to. And it's, it's, um, it helps us, I think, in some ways because we can actually have our, our, our commitment to helping others become a bit pedestrian. Like, yeah, I'm a, like many people on this call, I'm someone who is of service on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I'm a frontline provider, I'm a health provider, I do this, that, that, I help people. And then I go home and I, you know, get to just, you know, not be a bodhisattva anymore. And I'm gonna, you know, kind of think poorly about other people who I see on social media. And I'm going to, um, you know, recklessly, you know, engage in activities that are actually harmful for my own body. Um, and so it's like, we're really, we're kind of like, just like giving ourselves this ultimate like Olympian level goal to help us keep kind of vigilant um, and keep engaged. So I, I would definitely never convince anyone to do a vow without feeling it, but um, I really appreciate the question. I appreciate that response. If I could just, something else that comes up for me Please. with it is it clashes with my feminist ideals in a way. And I know <laughs> I'm having a reduction Standing, but I'm like, I can't, you know, and then I also recognize the part where, well, when I neglect my needs completely, I become completely unable to help anybody else. So, yes, yeah. that's right. And that's why, and such a, a beautiful yes, um, and a beautiful segue to um, the next part of the, the slogan. But I, I will say that we don't take refuge in being a bodhisattva. We do take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, so that we can be the Bodhisattva. And I think you're pointing out something that myself and many people I know um, get in the unfortunate um, kind of uh, stickiness of, because it feels naturally rewarding to be of service. It does, it feels good and it's in alignment, but we can almost, yeah, make our home there at consequence of our own well being, right? We, do that all the time and, and, and then there's burnout. And then I really appreciate the, the feminist um, call of, isn't this what we always do as women? Aren't we always laying down as the doormat so that the world can you know move over us? Um, and there's a way of being a bodhisattva, I mean, the way of the um, compassionate warrior is the bodhisattva path. And so this idea that it's really, it's fierce. I think is so powerful. And I so appreciate, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, the Dakini, right? Who this powerful feminine. Um, and I think we can embody that while still being, it's just so amazing to be strong and gentle. I don't think that's instructed to us as women. I'll, I'll speak for myself. That was never instructed to me as a woman. And it's something that I've really um, loved learning through practice. This incredible strength and discipline and gentleness. Oh, thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, I see something from Walt here. Hi, Walt. Uh, for me, it seems like dreaming the impossible dream, but maybe life's a journey and not a destination. Yes, yeah. Like we take this vow on as, um, yeah, the impossible dream, right? As I've heard um, a number of times from leaders in racial justice and activism, it's, I am the impossible dream of my ancestors come true. So maybe this vow is like, feels like the impossible dream. Who knows, right? Leaving that open. Um, for the possibilities. And maybe we learn it and we do our best and then we model it to those who are coming up around us and that they, they then can live it out. These are not the values most of us grew up with. <laughs> These are not them, right? We are working at deficit to try to start understanding and applying these values in our life. So just, we don't know. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, the St. Francis prayer. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. It is interesting. There's definitely similarities with this prayer um, by some of the Christian uh, mystics I've seen of. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next part here, which is refraining from outrageous and ostentatious conduct. Uh, and that seems kind of obvious, right? Like how are we gonna be on this path if we are being outrageous? But the outrageous here is actually a little bit what Leanne was pointing us to. The outrageous is don't try to become a bodhisattva and like overdo it by giving yourself to others. Don't become a martyr. Don't make a big show out of like how spiritual you've become. And in fact, it's interesting. It, there's, there's one um, translation of it where if you kind of have this, you know, performative way of enacting your bodhisattva vow. You know, I am this hero, here I am doing this good work in the world, that actually you end up creating a separateness. You are the, the good being and someone else is the victim. Um, and so I find it really interesting that what this part of the slogan invites us to is humility. And um, I am, I'm delighted to say that um, there is actually some research in humility. Um, and maybe Katie knows about some of this in terms of contemplative science. Um, really for decades and decades, humility was just not considered anything worth studying or looking at. Fortunately, as psychology has oriented, not just towards what is toward ill-being and disease, but kind of these flourishing or positive qualities, humility is like kind of pushing up. People are really excited about gratitude and compassion, and I am all for those practices. Humility is still not getting the attention it deserves, but I did hear um, there was an enormous grant to, I think it was either UC Irvine or UC Riverside, to study humility at a much greater level. And I think about one quality that's like antithetical to our contemporary political culture <laughs> and it is humility. And, um, and so I was digging in a little bit um, to the humility research and, you know, I think it's interesting, um, you know, this is again from this Western or modern scientific approach and what humility is defined as is at the intra personal level, like within us, just an accurate view of yourself, <laughs> which is like really not that much to ask. But when we think of all the projection and delusion of our egoic structures, right? Needing to be good, needing to not be bad, somehow getting this idea that we are this fixed person all the time that we don't change. The other day I was remembering what it was like to be 22. It just kind of came to me. And I had this distinct memory of just like what it was like to be in that consciousness and have no real sense that I would ever be older, right? So all these just like different ways that were diluted. So at the very simple level, humility is just an accurate view of yourself. Not only am I who I am now, I will change. 
<laughs> I was someone different. I will be someone different. So this like accurate view of the self, which I, I really like, and all the things I'm putting in as the, the Buddhist slant on this is not in the psychology, but very uh, complimentary. And then on the interpersonal level with others, humility involves a stance that is other oriented instead of self-focused. It's like being a bodhisattva. So I was really delighted. Um, so when we look at this definition of humility, what we're seeing is that those people who have what are called kind of traits of humility, right? So we're doing this through survey research, also through some basic behavioral research of identifying how people act in different situations. That this sense of humility makes us think about ourselves as part of the whole, to think about others. And there's really, I, I, um, I really love research in which we examine writing, because when we look at writing, especially um, self-reflective writing, what we're looking at is our own internal narrative, how we view ourselves in the world, which is our, the closest thing we have to understanding our reality. And in the research on humility, the way that they're studying different traits of humility is having people write, having them write about certain experiences. And when they read these passages, they look for different words. And they find that when people who are humble, so they've measured them to say, okay, these people have these qualities of, you know, accurate view of themselves, really valuing others, that these are people who use language with more words like we and us and our and together. Whereas the people who are not humble are using a lot more words of they and them and my and own which is just so fascinating. And so there's been you know, a good deal of research on what's called this interpretation of language. And so when we look at just even how we use our words. So we could think again, back to the question of how do we start in some ways with our bodhisattva activity or how do we start with our vow? We can notice how we speak about ourselves and others. There was another one. Yeah, they also say often they say, uh, Generally speaking, they say uh, um, and more instead of no, people who are humble. <laughs> um, and that they emphasize connection instead of skepticism, judgment, superiority, and disconnection. So yeah, I, I just found it to be super fascinating. And that was just a little bit of the research um, that I was looking at on how they've measured humility and how we can understand it, but it's so useful. It's useful not only in that, indeed, we can find humility, um, but also you can, you can train it. As in many of these kind of pro-social skills in psychology, empathy, awe, gratitude, it's trainable. Which of course, um, you know, these Lojong slogans are intended to do. There would be no Lojong slogans if it wasn't possible to train our heart and mind. So I'm, um, yeah, I think I'm newly in love with humility. And some of you who have maybe had the um, opportunity to spend time with uh, monastics in, in many traditions, I've, I've spent more time with monastics in the Tibetan tradition. Humility is like their first, middle, and last name. <laughs> it's like, they're like, oh yeah, I meditate sometimes. I'm like, yeah, you're the Dalai Lama. Yeah, we know, we know that you meditate sometimes. <laughs> Just like outrageous humility, almost that you're like, this is, but I think it's a really, sweet and interesting aspect of this like advanced level of practice. Like the more humility seems to really well map onto really accomplished practitioners, which is again, a bit like flying in the face of what we see in our contemporary culture, where unfortunately, you know, to be a, a an accomplished professional person, you have to be like, you have to be confident and arrogant. I'm really good. So it's just, it's so interesting um, to think about what it means to take on or address or look at these qualities of humility within ourselves. And, you know, if we think of the humble people who we know, we like those people. There's a little bit of research I, I didn't include in my notes, but where <laughs> humble people are, are some kind of called the social oil. Like they really help relationships because they're willing to like make space for the other, 
right? And that interpersonal level. So I just, I found that little aspect really beautiful. And so that aspect um, of that aspect of the slogan, a little, little bit unexpected there, refraining from ostentatious conduct or outrageous conduct is actually practicing humility, right? And not overdoing it. I really appreciate it. Not overdoing it with our bodhisattva activity, keeping it reasonable so we can sustain ourselves. Um, okay. And then the other aspect here, the last of the three. So again, if we go back to this slogan, um, it says, always abide by the three basic principles, keeping our commitments, um, refraining from outrageous conduct. And then the third, which again, I think will be pretty familiar um, for everyone here is cultivating um, of patience. But the flavor for this one is a little bit different. The flavor for this patience is that we don't fall into that one-sidedness or that we don't have double standards. So that when we're developing our heart and our mind, when we're kind of establishing this inner compass, what are, who, what are our ethics and morals for? As the example I gave before, it's not as though we do what we do in the world as bodhisattvas and then we come home and yeah, but our, our friends and our family and our kids, like they don't count. We don't do bodhisattva activity with them just out in the world, right? So really not having the patience to, um, you know, what Pema Chodron called, which I loved. She said that this practice is one, the one of patience is one where we just learn to pause just long enough to listen and to learn and to reflect. Just pause. So these are the three principles that we are making clear to ourselves what our commitments are in this practice. The commitment of this vow to be a refugee, <laughs> to find our home only with the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha and knowing that to be our true home that we are able to get a glimpse of that bodhi, bodhisattva vow and what it means to us. That we are able to cultivate this humility, this accurate view of who we are and this ability to want to connect to and serve others, but not with like a whole show about it. And that we cultivate patience. And patience is just <laughs> not the skill or quality that most of us first think of when we think about becoming a spiritual warrior. That doesn't seem top on our list. But with patience, what we see is a real emphasis on that pause that allows us to reduce our aggression, our inner aggression and our outer aggression. Our patience really helps us in our vow of nonviolence, non-harming. I really know what it feels like to not be patient. <laughs> it's aggressive. It is. It's like, no, like, stop it. Like, it should be different. And so to really be, you know, not too hard on ourselves about that, but to be honest and clear about that and adhere ourselves to developing this patience. It's hard. But the patience is the exact same in the practice as out of the practice. The patience of why is my mind like this <laughs> as we are trying to focus on our breath and it's over here and it's over there. Can you be patient with that mind? Not can your mind be different? Can you be patient with the mind as it is? It's the same in our world. It's not like, you know, wow, my neighbor who is so loud I wish they would just stop. Can we be patient with them being loud as they are? Yeah, of course, we do everything in our power to help reduce a harm, but the patience is really what gets us through because so many things are outside of our control, right? And if we can develop and generate a feeling of dignity and honor with patience, prioritize it, we are just going to have such an easier time on our bodhisattva path because it all takes a long time and all of it can be heartbreaking at, at times. And can we be patients, patient with the heartbreak so that we can continue to see ourselves through? 
you know. So um, I'm going to take a moment here. <laughs> yes, patience is, is a hard one. I'm going to take a moment here for us to come back into a brief practice in which we really reflect on these commitments. So wherever it's comfortable for you, in a seated posture to just come right home into the embodied experience. And as your eyes are softly closed, imagine as though they were gazing directly at your heart. And with the sense of interconnection to one's own heart. Let's take a moment here to really inquire. What am I committed to? And if this question feels hard, maybe just rest in the sensation of the body, of the mind, of the heart, when we ask that question, to what am I committed? And because all of you have joined here this evening and it's not a random gathering, I assume that some part of what you are committed to is cultivating your heart and your mind. I'm taking a moment here to really focus on this commitment. and recognizing that this commitment is hard and difficult. That transforming our mind and heart means that we have to look deeply at everywhere that we are stuck. And taking into account that this commitment is one in which we will need that patience. And it may take time for us to truly develop this mind and heart. That there will be obstacles along the way. And generating just the spark here of compassion for ourselves. You can consider the simple words and phrases of compassion, wishing that we would be safe, wishing that we would experience belonging, wishing that we could be free from suffering. And giving ourselves this self-compassion through our inhale and exhale, knowing that without it, there is no way to live up to our commitments.
Let the feeling of self-compassion as much as possible be non-conceptual, be felt. If some words help you generate the feeling, please use them. Otherwise, as you inhale, inhale in this felt sensation of deep caring, deep forgiveness, deep loving of the self. And as you exhale, exhale that same loving forgiveness and caring of the self. And then expanding our sphere of concern for just a moment, all of us as bodhisattvas. Extend this wish of compassion, of forgiveness, and of love to all beings. Unfathomable and unknowable as it is to even recognize all beings, extend it anyway. Inhaling in with that radiant beauty of compassion and extending it out in all directions, above, below, side to side. And then releasing that aspiration and just coming home to the body once again. A couple more breaths here. Feeling the goodness, the trustworthiness of this body, this body of meditation, this body of practice. Beautiful bodhisattvas. I said I would uh, spend a minute to talk about self-retreat. And um, if you have a day, two days, three days, whatever time you can carve out for yourself, um, I really recommend taking that time for practice if you have it over this winter holiday and break. There's a couple really in important things with self-practice all these say for me, but I think in general, they're helpful. When you're practicing in your home where you live, it is a lot harder and a lot nicer in other ways than practicing on a center. First of all, there's no one else around to support your practice. That's hard. So I really recommend, you know, whether it's going to the YouTube channel of the Dharma Collective or otherwise, finding some media for yourself. So I would, I would give yourself a couple guided meditations. So maybe throughout your day of practice, you decide I'm gonna wake up at 6 a.m. That would be really good and rigorous. And then I'm gonna do a practice on my own. I'm gonna do a walking. Then I'm gonna to listen to one meditation. Then I'm going to have some tea. The most important thing I have found, and this is what retreat centers do for us, is a very rigorous and rigid schedule make it ahead of time. 
Don't allow yourself to have any thinking about like, should I do this? Should I not do this? That pulls you out of the experience. Set a very rigorous schedule. If you want to listen to meditations, have them all um, kind of picked out ahead of time so that you don't have to go searching around for things. Like as much as possible, protect whatever time you have, really prepare for it. If possible, especially if you're doing more than one day, make a big pot of lentils and rice. Just eat that. Don't think about anything else. Keep it really simple, really simple. It is important to attend to your body. If you have a yoga practice, wonderful. If you can walk outside, wonderful. If you're in an urban setting and you walk outside, use your walk outside to send everybody meta. Just love every person you see, love every tree you see, all the beings. Um, but really setting aside that time where you have made a really specific schedule and you're committing to it and you're doing those practices. And again, I mean, it's unbelievable how many retreats there are that are you can self-pace online. Um, some of them cost money. Um, so you can, you know, put them together through the what is free on YouTube. Um, for some of you, um, myself included, I really enjoy chanting. You can also find some chanting so that you can do that in the evenings. But I would say a guided practice or at least one or two during the day a good meditation talk that really lifts your spirits and a very clear schedule. That's really all you need. And if possible, you know, turning off your phone, um, computer, if you're gonna listen to the meditations, you know, try to have them available so you're not like looking through and checking email at the same time. You know, retreat is really, it's, a, it's not just a retreat from the world, it's an expedition inward. But it's really hard to do with our kind of relative ordinary mind getting too stimulated. We want to like effectively, you know, like blanket ourselves into retreat. You know, we want to feel like cozy and in and not have any of the outside world. So as much preparation as you can do. Um, so is the idea to be entirely disconnected. So there's different traditions that have different approaches. In the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, reading and writing is not a problem. In the Vipassana traditions, that's not recommended. Um, so it depends on your orientation. I think a good Dharma book, it's like, there's nothing better. I, for me in my personal retreat, I start retreat every morning with half hour of reading and then practice. It's just a really nice way to enter into the world. There's so many amazing Dharma books out there. It's hard to know where to start. Um, yeah, and then I see Pierre, oh, Tar Brock um, has meditations. Yeah, um, Pure Retreats at the center. I love it. Yeah, and um, SoundCloud also has a lot of guided audio. So if you don't wanna you know, have more screen time, you can look at SoundCloud. I have a channel on there. Michael Owens has a channel on there. Michael Taft, you know, there's a lot of teachers who have guided meditation. So, and it's kind of amazing to put together your own retreat. It's pretty, you know, it's very creative. It can include drawing. It can include dancing, like make it your retreat. It's your Dharma. So, so great to be with you all. I dedicate the merit of our time together for the sake of all beings. May we all be free. Hmm. I don't want to compete with Michael Owens, but I am teaching on Friday at Big Heart City. So if, if you guys, you can watch recording of one or the other. Um, I think I'm going to teach on emptiness just to get weird. Uh, so if that's appealing to you, please join. Otherwise, see you soon. <laughs> People can unmute themselves and say goodbye if they want. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Welcome. Last preliminary, Leanne, was um, that there is suffering. It's inevitable. I know. Like having to choose between Eve and MC Owens on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs>
unpleasant Vedana. Very unpleasant. So funny. I was I was like, what are you going to talk about for those guys? I was like, God, I think I'm going to talk about emptiness. I was like, that is not what I expected, but that's what that's what's coming up. Wait, is that how it goes? No, now you can. Oh, no, I fixed it, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's fixed. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Yay! How are you guys? <laughs> I just wanted to say thanks, everybody. It's so awesome to see everybody. Thanks for sharing and sharing the prayers and your thoughts and everything. And mm. it's just awesome. So thank you so much. Thanks for sharing the kitty. Yeah. Catalina yeah. says hello. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs>